You're watching World Insights still to come on our program. The race against the clock for a proven COVID-19 vaccine seen as a panacea against the pandemic. How long before the world gets one? Direct answers from the International Vaccine Institute head right after this break. 12 to 18 months is, has been the estimate. Welcome back. You're watching World Insight. An efficient vaccine could be the magic bullet that would take a bite out of the COVID-19 pandemic. With a dire need to protect the big populations from the coronavirus, researchers are racing against time around the world to hurdle the steps in producing one. With many vaccine candidates in the making, it's the question on everybody's mind. When can the world finally have it? I got direct answers from Jeremy Kim, the head of the International Vaccine Institute. Let's listen in. Dr. Kim, tell me more about how long do we still have to wait until a vaccine for COVID-19 can be available? That's a very important question and one that a lot of people have been asking. Typically, usually, it takes between five and 10 years to develop a vaccine. Uh, but these are not usual circumstances. So scientists around the world are hoping that we are able to prove that a vaccine works in 12 to 18 months. We understand that both in China and in the United States, there are already trials, clinical trials going on in terms of vaccines. So what can we expect? How much do we know about these vaccine candidates? So we know uh, correspondingly less than we would under normal circumstances because really, I mean, China knew about this illness uh, at the end of December and the rest of us really learned a lot about it um, when Chinese scientists released all the information about the illness uh, in the middle of January. So that, that the fact that we have vaccines under uh, testing in humans uh, in, I guess that would be two months, uh, is really a remarkable achievement uh, in vaccine development. What are some of the priorities as a scientist that needs to look at during the process of clinical trial just to make sure that, that will be the priority? Can you help us to understand some of the important points? Yes. Um, so I, I can actually talk a little bit about um, the questions that we don't know the answer to because ahead, actually sir. those will give you some insight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we really believe, but we don't know for a fact, that people who've been infected once uh, are protected against future infection. That's important because it means that, you know, if you were infected and your body has fought off the virus, if you are now protected, it means that um, we, that the body makes responses that can protect people against the virus. That means that we hope a vaccine can do the same thing. So that's a really important proof. Mm -hmm. And actually Chinese scientists have shown that in monkeys, monkeys that are infected once are probably not able to be infected again. And that's an important proof of concept. The second very important thing that we need to know is we don't really know exactly what responses, what, what protective mechanisms the body has are the protective ones. We're going for what we believe to be the, the best antibody. These are infection fighting proteins and killer cells, which, um, which kill uh, the virus uh, that's in cells in the body. Mm -hmm. And we think that a balance of those two is really important. So we'd like to test that in an animal model and in the animal model, we're going to look to see that if we give the vaccine and then challenge the animal, a mouse or a, a ferret or a monkey, mm -hmm. uh, with the, the virus, that it prote the vaccine protects against infection. And that's actually where we can look for the first safety signal. Not only does it have to protect the animal, mm -hmm. but it has to make sure, we have to make sure that the animal itself doesn't have some other effect uh, from the challenge. Mm -hmm. And the final thing that we really need to know is you know, it's fine to test things in animals, but as we move this into humans, what are we going to do? So in the initial test, you move a little slowly because you want to make sure that the vaccine doesn't cause any immediate reactions. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. As you increase the number of people, as you go from the first phase to the second phase to the third phase of human clinical testing, you gradually increase the number from, you know, roughly 50 to several hundred to usually several thousand. Yeah. And all along, Every you know, seven days, you're, right after a vaccination, you call the, the volunteer and say, are you okay? Have you been having any problems? Um, we watch people if they've gotten the vaccine and gotten infected, because again, we wanna make sure that the vaccine isn't doing anything uh, that is harmful to individuals. 
Uh, and then we have a longer term follow up. So you get a vaccine and or you know sometimes you have to get a booster vaccine. Mm -hmm. We don't know that any vaccine that's given now, how long it will last. So we have to keep checking the people who receive the first vaccines uh, in order to see how long these supposedly protective responses will last. And is there any problem if the protective responses drop below a certain level? Mm -hmm. So the people who develop vaccines are always watching and, and continue to watch a, a volunteer in a vaccine trial. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Kim, since you talk about the three stages, usually how long the three stages would take under this circumstance that everybody is longing for a viable vaccine right now for COVID-19, what are likely to be the time frame for the three stages if things go smoothly? That's a precondition. Right, right. If the vaccine passes all the preset criteria for moving forward, that's exactly right. Um, we will hope to have information from the initial testing in two to three months, yeah. which will mean that the phase two study could start a little bit sooner than that before all the data are complete. But once we have information on safety, the phase two is really designed to look at the target population, the population that we would like to have vaccinated ultimately, and to make sure that it makes the right protective responses mm -hmm. in enough people to be able to tell. That's why it's usually on the order of uh, a couple of hundred. And then often again, before the end of that, in this accelerated scenario, we might be able to start phase three of testing um, in a much larger population, but one in which we see the disease. So for instance, some people are thinking, maybe we should vaccinate doctors and nurses. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we should go to a country with a relatively high burden of disease now and vaccinate people who are not infected. Because in order for us to prove that the vaccine is protecting against infection, we actually have to give it to people who might, um, through the course of their daily lives, be exposed to virus and become infected. Yeah. Um, so we hope to start that one probably at the end of this year or early next year. Mm -hmm. And depending on you know how many infections uh, or how serious the problem is, then you know, you, in several months, you might know whether the vaccine uh, is actually working to protect right. against infection and disease. That's, That's why right. I think 12 to 18 months is, has been the estimate for people. Yeah. It's not just China and some of the Western countries in Europe, uh, North America now. The virus is in 200 countries and also developing countries are likely to be the next group of countries suffer the most from COVID-19. So um, how to make the vaccine once it is available, uh, quickly manufactured and also safe with safety. Meanwhile, make it low cost or no cost to those a population that in urgent need will be a gigantic task. Um, we've been doing some of those tests earlier. Uh, you were also and your organization involved in some of those uh, possibilities. But what about for the very urgent situation like this when the vaccine is anew, if we had one? That's a really great question. And um, so organizations uh, like CEPI, uh, have in their um, in their charter uh, a need to uh, make sure that the vaccines that are developed are available for use throughout the world. Yeah. And remember that if we have to vaccinate a good part of the world's population, you know, even half of seven billion people is 3.5 billion doses of vaccine. Absolutely. So no one company, even you know Johnson and Johnson, committed to making a billion doses. A billion doses is not going to protect even the majority of people in this world. Yeah. So I think that there's an understanding that there probably will need to be either more than one vaccine made by more than one company in large quantities, or there will need to be some um, mechanism to transfer the ability to manufacture these vaccines to a number of different companies uh, around the world, each of which can, can produce you know, millions and millions of doses. For instance, uh, Indian and Chinese companies can easily produce tens of millions of doses mm -hmm. of vaccines, which they do routinely. Um, in the Chinese uh, Chinese vaccines, the, most of them are approved by the regulatory authority in China. Yes. Uh, the same is true for Indian companies. And then they get a subsequent approval from the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. That we call prequalification. Prequalification allows the vaccine to be purchased by uh, UNICEF, for instance, United Nations organizations, uh, or, and given to Gavi, which is the Global Alliance uh, right. for Vaccines and Immunization, Gavi provides vaccines at low or no cost to the countries that can't afford it. So again, 
the world has mechanisms to distribute vaccine. And we're hoping that you know, as we move forward, uh, the companies and the organizations like CEPI and governments, like the government of China, the government of the United States, are going to realize that, that we together as a world have a lot at stake in making sure that everyone has access mm. to effective vaccines. Yeah, another question just to follow up, but who would get it first? Who would get it earlier than later? That's going to make a huge difference, and that's also going to lead to a lot of debates, if not fight. Uh, Dr. Kim, we saw many of these stories in movies, you know, about uh, epidemics or pandemics. Uh, but many really wonder, in our lifetime, are we going to see some of those fights taking place right in front of our eyes as a result of the right. uh, vaccine? Go ahead, sir. Yes, and absolutely that question, and then also to make sure that the vaccine that's being put out, I mean, when people get desperate, um, there are going to be imitations and artificial products and, and things that are going to try to take money from people and not offer any protection at all. So mm -hmm. we see that with medicines. Um, so I think that the, the key here is we don't have a vaccine that's, that's been shown to be protective against the disease. Mm. So the time to talk about prioritization of people within a country, of countries, um, is really now. We have to start that discussion now. And organizations like the World Health Organization and CEPI um, are going to be important from an international perspective at helping us to understand you know, what's important. Will the United States insist that you know, a vaccine that the U.S. government pays for um, be used in Americans first? Probably. The same would be true of China. Um, organizations like CEPI take funding from a lot of different countries. Mm -hmm. And so CEPI will have to have a different approach. We'll have to have an approach that is more cooperative, more collaborative, mm -hmm. more the kind of thing where you know, smaller countries, say, like Korea or Germany, which don't have the same capacity as China, the United States, or India, will have to really make a, a collective decision mm -hmm. on how to protect people best. And really, the time to do it is now. Within a population, if you had the first 100,000 doses of vaccine, would, who would you vaccinate? Yeah. Would you vaccinate doctors and nurses? Because they're really critical for providing care up front and, and limiting the suffering from disease. Would you vaccinate um, politicians so that there's effective control over governments, uh, policemen, uh, ambulance drivers, I mean, th those kinds of choices are the ones we should make before we have to make a decision. Uh, because once we get close to the end, it's going to be more and more difficult to do things in a, in a way that is systematic and rational. Yeah. My final question, Dr. Kim, earlier we tried with coronavirus vaccine, but failed for various reasons. Do we have confidence and how much about some of the candidates that it's available right now and possibly be the one that's likely to be used by all of us in the future, Dr. Kim? So that's a, that's a great question because we've had SARS, which is a coronavirus, yeah. the first one uh, in the early 2000s. And then we had the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is another coronavirus that hit Korea in 2015, but has been a problem in the Middle East since around 2011 or 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have vaccines against the other two. But in the first case, SARS, the first SARS actually kind of disappeared. Yes. And, um, and part of the issue with that SARS was that most people who were infectious were very symptomatic, so it was easy to identify them and isolate them. With MERS, MERS is not contagious, is not as contagious. So it doesn't spread as readily as, as the current version, as uh, COVID-19 does in populations. So that makes it a lot um, easier to contain. It makes it actually easy, more difficult to develop the vaccine against MERS because it really occurs in tiny little outbreaks in hospitals, or clusters of families um, in the Middle East, you know, where one of the people might have been exposed to a camel that, yeah. that was carrying the virus. Um, with SARS, the fact that the, the disease disappeared made it impossible to take further vaccines forward. Mm -hmm. um, I think the issue with COVID is that the disease will probably be with us. I think everyone has heard the projections now that Asia will probably see a second or maybe even a third wave of, of infections. And so Asian governments will continue to be on guard so I think um, we will have COVID, and that's the reason why um, vaccine, a vaccine will probably be tested uh, within the period of, of 12 to 18 months, and hopefully one of them will be shown to be effective. Yeah. Why do I think that we might have a chance? 
I think that there's some evidence that people who've been infected once are not, uh, can't be infected again. The vaccines have been hardest to develop, vaccines against HIV, vaccines against tuberculosis or malaria. In those cases, the immune system's response to the, uh, say, HIV or TB uh, is not sufficient to clear the disease, to suppress the disease. With COVID-19, we've seen a lot of people um, who've recovered, and we believe that those people are going to be immune to future infections, and that would raise some hope uh, that we should be able to develop a vaccine. The more important part, again, you know, other than safe, uh, efficacy is safety, and we absolutely have to make certain yes. that any vaccine that we develop not only protects against the disease itself, but doesn't have any um, side effects that we hadn't anticipated uh, that we weren't planning for that, you know, are going to surprise us because we want vaccines to protect people and keep them healthy.